And you're back here with the awkward interviews, keeping it awkward as always. I have my friend Scott Hessinger here. Um, this is an honor. Um, Scott, for almost a decade, was a public defender in Brooklyn, uh, representing people uh, charged with crimes who couldn't afford an attorney. Um, and since then, uh, you know, for that entire time period, was also building up his uh, reputation as an expert. Um, public defender outside of the court, uh, featured in a variety of media with his goal of shifting the narrative um, around criminal, so to speak, justice and driving systemic change. Um, while practicing, Scott co-founded the Brooklyn Community Bail Fund, which uh, freed thousands of people caged pre-trial uh, solely because they couldn't afford uh, bail. Um, and was then appointed director of policy leading creative defender advocacy uh, for Brooklyn Defender Services, uh, where he was responsible for designing and implementing uh, new media advocacy films and campaigns. Uh, these included We Have Rights, which focused on uh, national immigration issues, Justice is Blindfolded, um, which addressed laws that allow prosecutors to withhold evidence in the state of New York, where he and I are both located. Uh, the Power of or Power of Prosecutors, uh, it's a national get out the vote effort for DA races. Um, super important as we see in Portland and Philadelphia, New York City and elsewhere. Um, and Perpetual Punishment, addressing collateral consequences of this system nationwide. Um, after that, Scott founded his own organization um, called Zealous. Um, I asked him the other day if he was hiring and I was only partially kidding. Um, they do incredible work. It's legal advocacy, um, media and movements for defenders, social justice leaders, communities, and artists. And I'm gonna have Scott explain um, what exactly they do um, and if he's willing to put me uh, on the uh, bench there. Um, and finally, also of note, uh, Scott is a uh, lecturer in law at Columbia University Law School. Um, Scott, thank you so much for joining me. I called you a hero before, I, I really do mean that. Um, You've actually been involved very recently in sharing two really important uh, pieces uh, from the news. One was a study um, that you called, I believe, uh, yeah, the most robust study on the topic of incarceration in history. Um, and the other was an article you wrote for The Nation about the propaganda we're seeing um, in the New York Times um, and NPR and elsewhere. Um, where they're ignoring all the facts and basically doing the PR for the police departments. Um, so uh, let's start there. Uh, thank you for joining me. Um, let's start with the propaganda. What the heck is going on right now? First of all, really good, really good to be there. And I appreciate the long um, and, and robust uh, introduction. I am no hero, though, and I, it's an honor for me to be on the show. Uh, you could have boiled it down to, um, and I should uh, just like scratch my whole bio and just say, um, I saw some shit when I was in court for eight years by some like an exceptional amount every single day. I happened to be white and privileged and was able to share my perspective. And um, I'm really happy that people uh, started paying attention to those everyday injustices. Um, and so, uh, and I'm just, yeah, it's an honor to be able to just to, to continue talking about it um, and, and support other people doing it. Copaganda, first of all, I think it's, uh, it's really great that more people are starting to use the word uh, copaganda. I was on, I was on a show uh, recently and one of the anchors called it cop agenda, which um, <laughs> they read it wrong, but it's kind, it's kind yeah. of what it means. First yeah. of all, like, what is copaganda? It's, a play on obviously propaganda and cops. We see it ordinarily. Um, it's in uh, pictures often of, of police shooting basketball in the community to kind of promote, promote promote this idea that they are of the community and they are they are loved. We see propaganda in uh, initial um, reports or their statements about what happened. Uh, and what they would call a quote unquote police involved uh, shooting. Uh, but often what propaganda is, is what we see in just everyday journalism. It's, it's um, what's been really in existence for the last half century. It's what has got us into this, 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 this 
crisis of mass incarceration, mass criminalization, which is that media, liberal bastions like the New York Times and, and NPR down to you know, crappy rags like the New York Post, um, only go to police as sources. And they ask them about short-term data. They kind of are stenographers for whatever the police tell them are the causes of any minute spike in crime and then claim credit when you know, crime rates go down. Um, it's um, allowing them to, um, to talk about the fact that they police um, and kind of along with the police prosecutions and prisons are the answer to societal ills, like um, the fact that we're not safe and we're unhealthy. And, um, and unfortunately, uh, this propaganda, uh, like propaganda, is very compelling. We as a society have grown up from, we were trained from the moment that we're born, um, not really the moment that we're born, uh, because we don't watch TV and understand, but like, you know, a couple years in, that police officers are, are, are only good, and they're there for justice, and prosecutors are interested in fairness and good outcomes, and that they should be trusted all the time. But what this has gotten us into is, we believe what we hear, um, we believe what we see on the news, and that then translates into public opinion, which translates into policy and lawmaker decisions, which translates into perpetuating costly, racist, inhumane, totally irrational and failed policies. And so, that's All right. it. yeah, I mean, I, that's a lot. Just no, no, but that, but that's it. I mean, you, I don't think it was, you know, um, I don't think it was too extensive. It, it described the cycle. It's what, you know, um, Angela Davis talks about in Our Prisons Obsolete, that at the time that crime was going down, prison construction and talk of murders on TV were all skyrocketing. Um, you mentioned this has been going on for at least a half a century. Um, Mark Anthony Neal wrote about the myth of the good cop um, in um, Colin Kaepernick's Abolition for the People series. Um, but to me, it seems like it's ramped up. I, I, I just feel like, um, you know, do you, do you believe, how, how do you think the um, increasing attention to the concept of defunding or abolition has contributed to what, you know, to your average reader just looks like common reporting on the latest stats, but may or may not be insidious and intentional coming from specific people saying, we have to put an end to this. I, I, I think you know, your, your question is, 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 is right on um, because uh, first of all, the premise of it, which is that it seems a lot worse right now is true. Um, and for different reasons than it was back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. The 70s, 80s, and 90s were pro-carceral forces, police prosecutors, carceral interests, trying to ramp up, trying to expand uh, the, the carceral system. So the amount of things that became crimes that you could be arrested for, uh, the, the severity of the charges that prosecutors could charge, the, um, the increasing use of pretrial detention, mandatory minimums. And so you saw a you know, tripling of the, the just amount of people that were in the system, um, surveilled or actually caged or otherwise arrested. Now, it's actually, I see it, and maybe this is me being super optimistic, but I see the, the kind of the current ramp up of the same kind of tricks, propaganda, um, and then use of media as a sign that the defund, the movement to defund the police, the movement for black lives, the, the, the increasing numbers of people talking about abolition, the iPhone footage, the conversations actually working and terrifying police, they feel threatened. And so what they're doing is falling back on the same tactics that worked to get them, get them there to continue perpetuating it. And short term, if you look at it right now, it definitely feels like the movement's losing, right? Because again, Media is continuing to fall for it, and people are continuing to, to get duped by it, and budgets are increasing, um, despite the fact that the New York Times last week um, published a front page story that implied that they had been deep funded and then refunded um, after crime went down, or when crime went up. For those, but, who didn't, <clears throat> for those who didn't read it, what did they say exactly? So, and okay, I'm not going to give that much credit to the folks that have been like mincing words. 
what it, it essentially the 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 headline said um, that after, a year after defund, and they put defund in quotes, um, uh, police departments are, are getting their money back. What it implies is a number of things. First of all, the fact that defund is put in quotes is disparaging of the movement itself. It's kind of a sarcastic kind of throwaway. It also implies for readers that are not only, only reading the headline and not thinking more, thinking, um, more critically or just know the facts that defund actually happened when it didn't anywhere, um, especially in partnership with the other part, they got their money back. Um, the truth of the, is, and, and so the New York Times writes this, this, um, this piece, this is a week after they uh, had published a piece that I wound up writing about in the nation because it followed these really familiar patterns of media regurgitating uh, police talking points and sourcing the moment is really I, I did not have hope or expectation that my one piece would change. New York Times reporting was a little bit disappointing, though a week later to see this. But this is the New York Times, the paper of record on the front page. And what was really upsetting, upsetting, it was upsetting to see. But then I saw the effect of it right away. I got an email from a progressive intellectual who has a massive mailing list. And he sent a um, sent, a, sent this, the story to his whole group and the subject line was refund the police. And it talked about the fact that, you know, it basically bought the assumption and the presumption hook, line and sinker. And I wrote back to him. And again, the things that I said was, was the truth. No police departments are defunded, um, uh, number one. So they couldn't have been refunded. No police were, departments were defunded. Um, and therefore, of course, no defund caused any kind of crime increase, even though there wasn't really a crime increase. Uh, number three, um, uh, everything was wrong. I mean, I just kept going. I was just like, everything is 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 wrong is wrong about this. But you saw the impact right away, and so this goes back to the, the where we where we started with this whole this whole journey to wherever we wherever I just ended up, which is that like that email shows like right now losing. But, but I feel like more and more people are identifying by just the word propaganda and the fact that like, you know, Twitter threads about calling out the New York Times and NPR are catching fire. And we're talking about this right now. More people are becoming aware that this is a thing. This is a thing that you need to be aware of, like identifying the direct line between media and incarceration. Um, media and perpetuation of, of cruelty, media and horrible criminal, uh, horrible policy. Because um, it's only once we realize as consumers what we're being fed as bullshit that we can, I don't know, by the way, I also don't know if I can curse this, but anyway, I'm just going for it. <laughs> but um, uh, that we can actually, A, start calling papers out, calling them in too. You know, we want them to be better um, and stop getting duped so we can hold our leaders accountable to actually do things that are smart yes. and not just grounded in, in kind of old ideology, best case and worst case intentioned right. to hurt people. Yeah. And all right. So let's, let's do one correction before I move on to a, um, my next question. And I don't mean a correction of you. I mean, I think you are, you're correcting me. I, I read um, I think like in April or something that, you know, a year f at a year from the start of the George Floyd protests, about 20 cities had partially defunded a total of X million dollars and reallocated those funds to like in Austin um, programs for ho the houseless community. Um, and I know as you know, that the, the articles just talking about crime rates increasing, those are fabricated. And in fact, in cities where they have developed alternative programs where there's a non-police response to, for instance, mental health issues, like in New York City or Portland, the programs are working. So was the, the first part of my statement, is that just misinformation that I got? Yes. Wow. Yes. So, so for, for, first of all, there were what, what we saw at the height of the protests following the police murder of George Floyd and increasing attention and political pressure um, for uh, defunding the police, right? We saw 
a lot of lip service. We saw a lot of conversation. We saw bills. We saw legislation. Um, first of all, in those conversations, we weren't even getting close to any concept of defunding. We we're talking about pennies, less than one percentiles of bloated hundred yes. million dollar. Okay, and, hold on and, one uh, second. Wait, yeah. hold on one second. So, just to clarify, I'm talking defunding anything. And I, yes. and I don't include New York City, where they just moved the school safety officers to the education budget. I mean, literally cutting even 1%. Did, did even that not happen? So if you go into certain areas, there might have been like temporary like movements um, of money, temporary movements of money around. But within, but in terms of the budgets themselves and conversations about the budgets and in debates about the budgets at the end of the day they all increased um and so there was there was no there was no long term even kind of short term defunding um it was I mean, certainly because, not at a national level that's the also, part not right? at a national level but also it's it's this the word defund to get to even to even say that like putting some of the budget here over there or even like taking money away it's not it's just not how the budgets budgets work like they like short term some places invested a little bit more over here but not at the expense of the police it's okay. just they, they, there was like there was some moving around and other efforts failed and at the end of the day not a single police department lost a single dollar. And in yeah. fact, okay. most had increases. Again, I mean, getting if you, getting into um, individual police department budgets, I mean, there's ways to move money around, but at the end of the day, right? Like no money, like they didn't, cops didn't lose money. Right, and certainly that, <laughs> Sorry, well, I, I missed the last statement, would you say? I mean, it's, 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 it's a lie. Yeah. <laughs> it's basically what it was down to. Right, right. Um, and I and I do want to be factual, um, you know, and and whether the, but, you know, either way, whether they whether I mean, we do know that nationally in 2021 police spending increased. And so the whole concept of it decreasing and now re increasing to match where it was, that's clearly not an accurate supposition. Not an accurate supposition and just, you know, just might as well use the opportunity to point out, as I do a lot, that we are, that we spend more money and just invest more um, in policing, uh, prosecutions and incarceration than any other society in the history of the world. Right. And so we expect, I mean, people talk about data, right? Like you mentioned violence interruption programs and restorative justice programs and programs that send um, health workers to mental health crises instead of cops with guns. Those have barely been tried out. We can already get a sense that they're working. We have 50, yeah. we have centuries of, of, of data that show that despite our historic uh, investments in these so-called solutions, they're not working. Um, and so, the idea that we continue to invest in this failing problem be, and, and do so because the people who are getting the, you know, the systems that are getting $118 billion a year are telling us that um, you're not safe and you're not healthy, um, uh, which is, in my mind, an, a stunning indictment of, of the failure of their policies is because it's because we're ingrained to think this way. It's because the media is, 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 a, is, a, is a symbol of the problem here. Like, why are we doing this? It's so obvious to me. Um, and I think it's on, it's just, it's, we are a bit brainwashed um, yeah. and we're hopefully, hopefully helping to get us out of that. And, you know, and, and it's, and I think you were getting to the point that it's really amazing how they kill their own argument from like it, it, it there's a philosophical term for this, like about reasoning or whatever, where like what you're saying is defeating yourself because they're talking about how it, you're, you're not safe and you're not healthy. And I think this is what you were saying that what we've chosen to, to, to use to supposedly keep you safe and healthy doesn't work. That's what you're saying. You're saying it's not working. So how could the solution be more of it? Yeah, um, every time every time you hear a, a you, you hear a police chief or a prosecutor or a lawmaker say, you know, there's a cert, quote unquote surge in crime or surge in shootings. Um, uh, remember, 
there is what, whatever they're saying, whether it's true or not, is happening despite paying them billions of dollars to supposedly prevent that from happening. Right, um, right. We, and, and beyond that, you know, look, we know from data, again, a lot of data, years. I mean, you mentioned this, this massive yeah. report. Talk you know, about that. Tell me about that. Report comes out. We, we know from massive amounts of data that, that actually longer sentences do not have any impact on the crime. So this, this report came out from uh, University of Chicago and the report, it makes it actually is like undermines what it actually is. It's a meta-analysis. What's a meta-analysis? It's an analysis of multiple different, in general, there's lots of meta-analyses, but it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a study of a lot of studies that take place over you know, a range of years and a range of geographies using a range of different methodologies. I mean, in this case, the study was on, the, the meta-analysis was on 116 studies on the impact of longer sentences in crime. They found to a criminological certainty that there is no impact on, um, on, on crime rates by, by, by locking people up for longer. That was like number one, we know that. We know from a nut, so that came out at the same time that the FBI data came out. FBI data, so before even getting FBI data, that should have been the biggest, that should have been front page news. This is a criminological fact that, that sentencing schemes in every single state county, city, locality, big, small, the way that we've been operating for the past 50 years and continue to operate is based on a lie. It is actually really bad policy. So this is an amazing moment for us. We now know this. So we're going to make an informed decision going forward to not continue to do this. We're going to, we should change all of our sentencing laws. Um, you, not a blip. I mean, I, I posted about it on, on, on Twitter and people seem to pay some attention there. Um, but instead, during the same amount of time, what we heard was homicide spiked and bail reform and police and protests over police violence were to blame for it. That was the story. Um, when the, the data that came out from the FBI actually completely undermined those arguments. So um, we don't need to get it. Yeah, it just it's just that's the God context. of the data that show. <laughs> yeah, that, that's that's the context in which you and I are doing the work that we do. Um, so before we get into the specifics about Zealous, which, you know, I am really curious about, um, I, I, I'm kind of switching up this whole program where, you know, I was interviewing, I mean, this is all just like out of my ass. I, I, you know, there's no production value. There's no theme. I interview people that I respect and think people should hear what they have to say. Um, but over time I've realized one that my family needs me, so I have to cut back. And everyone is obsessed with the abolition conversations. It's what I'm known for. It's, I think, the conversations that I've had as part of this interview series that have most intrigued people. So I am canceling all my interviews that are not related to abolition. And also, I'm going to try to somehow combine all of this to create some tapestry, you know, all of the answers to similar questions that have been given to me to create kind of a narrative around what the current thinking on abolition is. And so to that end, um, you know, do you do you consider yourself an abolitionist? And if so, what does abolition mean? Yes. Or either way. Answer. Okay. Short answer is I do consider myself an abolitionist. Um, and what does it mean? I mean, maybe the way for me to answer this is how I came to that, which was not purposefully, I have to be completely frank and honest in being, becoming a public defender. I didn't even know or begin to comprehend the concept. I went into becoming a public defender because like I saw criminal justice as a civil rights issue over time. I didn't like the idea of people being caged. Um, and um, I, I wanted to tell more complicated stories to try to, you know, one, one, one person at a time. Uh, tilt the imbalance of, of justice. Um, and and from, from day one, um, I saw the way that the laws and policies that the system that we're trying to, that I now want to abolish and that I want to replace with something that will actually produce health and safety, um, that will produce fairness, that will produce justice, and that will be you know, a cost-efficient way of using my taxpayer dollars. Um, you know, how, how, I saw things that got me there. You know, I saw the, the, the way that the laws and practices uh, operated to just fail. You know, I saw right off the bat um, uh, how 
things like pretrial detention um, and mandatory minimums um, cause people to plead guilty before within 24 hours um, of their arrest. And then I realized then, you know, that, you know, people were pleading guilty, whether or not they were pleading guilty or whether or not they were guilty, uh, they were pleading guilty, uh, whether or not they were stopped and frisked unconstitutionally, and they were pleading guilty to worse and harsher sentences, not because of the merits of the case, um, but because of these, of, of these pressures. I saw the, the, the fact that the people that were coming into the system were, were uh, you know, by and large, vast majority of them uh, were there because of poverty, were there because they were suffering from substance use issues, mental health issues, were sleeping where they weren't supposed to be sleeping because they didn't have affordable housing. Um, and and, and uh, the fact that not only uh, was it just, there were just too many people coming through the system and they were predominantly black and brown, but the way that the system just spit them back out um, at you know, enormous cost and further marginalized and worse off. Um, but it wasn't just that, you know, meeting those, those folks who came through the system and seeing how uh, the, the system kind of uh, crushed, <laughs> crushed them and made them, made them worse off and, and kind of exacerbated the conditions that got them there. It was also, you know, the stuff that people say, well, what about the violent crimes? Well, then meeting more and more people over the year who were charged with violent offenses that who didn't harm anyone. Um, so, you know, possession of a gun with the under because of the understandable and reasonable fear for their safety because they had been previously hurt or they had seen seen violence or or other crimes like burglary in the second degree, which wasn't violent at all, which is where they just, you know, went into a, a you know, a, 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 I was about to say a bodega, that's a different form of burglary, but like went into a, a vestibule and, and basically stole because, to, to, you know, stole a, a penny. <laughs> it was all, all that would take, or stole like change to be able to support their habit. Um, but then I also met folks who were charged with actual violence, where they actually had harmed someone and realize that every, you know, to a person, everyone was more complicated than just that charge. And that they too, by and large, vast majority of them had been harmed. And I also saw how the people who they had harmed were not being healed by this process, weren't being listened to. Soup to nuts, basically day to day, ongoing, I just saw this immense waste of the system and realized that if our goal and I don't think the goal of the system is this. I think the goal of the system is actually to oppress. But if, if the goal is, as I think people should think, um, the, the purpose of society is for us to be health, you know, produce healthy, you know, health and safety. Things that everyone wants. You know, people think public defenders, we just want to get people out of jail. Like, yes. And, um, and we think that there are, there, there are better, more cost-effective, less racist ways to, to get to health and safety. That's what we want. We're doing it all wrong. And we need a page one rewrite. So, what are those alternatives? Number one. Um, so, I think one of the easiest things that it's still really, really painful that people can't see is for you know in in the in the kind of the vast majority of misdemeanors and nonviolent felonies, those things should not be crimes, right? If we instead of arresting people for jumping the turnstile, trespass, um, grand larceny, theft. Um, uh, drug use, uh, in, in, instead invest in mental health, instead of uh, in poverty alleviation and affordable housing, community, et cetera, um, we would see what, just greater health and at enormous cost savings. So that's like number one. That's like the easy. I mean, and, and, it, and, it's, and it's tough for me to wrap my head around how people could still think that um, criminalization is the way to go. And with violence, with, with, with violence number one, we got to realize that you know, police and prosecutors, we talked about this, don't prevent crime and police are spectacularly bad at solving violent crime. Um, it turns out, you mentioned this earlier, violence prevention on the front end. So these community led programs where people who have been harmed and or usually there's overlap harmed other people actually work to diffuse conflict before they actually happen. And when they happen, talk to people who have been harmed and those who have harmed others to try to bring them together to stop further for, uh, you know, further action and engage in a restorative justice process works dramatically better um, than arresting and caging someone and separating them from accountability. And um, uh, so investing more in violence interruption programs. And then on the flip side, once violence does happen, 
I mentioned restorative justice. It sounds beautiful and fancy and kind of whatever, but it, it actually works, right? So restorative justice, it brings folks together, the people who harmed um, others and the folks who have been harmed. Um, but it doesn't happen right away. You know, it's not like, okay, let's all get around in a circle. I just got shot. Let's like, let's work it out. It's an intentional, long time, long term process working with both people um, where there's consent um, and, and, uh, and, and thought. And what winds up happening is ultimately after a process, the people come together in a circle and it's a process over time where people, um, you know, the people who harm someone come to come face to face with them and listen. And it turns out that someone who is, instead of being kind of thrown into a cage, uh, pushed as far away from the harm they caused as possible, there's really no accountability there. But facing head on, that's where the accountability comes from. That's where deterrence comes from. That's where, you know, future, a future without violence comes from. And on the other side, really importantly, on the survivor of the crime side, or the family member side, um, they're able to feel, and this is, you know, it's not just like a couple people, this is like over years that we've seen this, over decades, feel a kind of healing that we know does not exist in the criminal context, in the criminal penal context, because we, we know when you look at um, uh, parole here, so, or, you know, you'll, you, you'll often hear one of the most common refrains is it feels like just like yesterday from survivors of crime. And the fact that decades later of someone being caged at millions of dollars, the person who was harmed, the surviving family members are still saying it feels like yesterday is evidence that the system doesn't work. So those are just, you know, some of the, some of the pieces. I mean, I could go and go in further, but um, they're also, you know, to the extent that they've been tried, they're true and they, and they, and they do, and they do work. The, 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 the issue is, we need to, as a society, have patience. Well, first of all, we need to have courage, like in like, like just the courage to like try something new. And then we need to have patience to let it actually run its course. If you decriminalize all the stuff that I think, should, I mean, I think we should, again, just decriminalize everything. Let's start even with the easy stuff. You're not going to see change right away. You need to give it years to be able to see change. Unfortunately, because of our attention span and because of the power of fear and media and propaganda, starting where, going back to where we started, um, it's really hard to, to, to see it through. But unless we do, um, we're never going to be able to, see, to, to prove to ourselves that a different way, met, uh, different way works. Yeah. And, <clears throat> and so first, thank you. Um, that was a beautiful <clears throat> description of, you know, restorative or transformative justice. Um, that I, I really haven't heard in that kind of depth before. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think that um, these, like these cases where it's happening, the small examples of it, like in New York City or in Portland, where these new pilots are happening, like I, I take so, I put so much stock in them. Um, and I'm so excited by the results thus far, because this is kind of like the, the, I think Dylan Rodriguez, when I talked with him, like described it this way, kind of like, it, it's like building our library of, of data and, you know, resources supporting what we're saying, um, along with the study you talked about earlier, that specifically showed that prison doesn't work, you know, combine that with evidence of things that do work, you know, mm -hmm. that's what we're really talking about, because often I get the question, um, or the statement, abolitionists like you, you always talk about what, what like why our current system sucks like why it doesn't work but i never hear any solutions which is why asking that question is so important whenever i do these interviews um because there are real alternatives and um you know so that's one big thing i hear another another thing i also hear is um yeah i believe everything that you're talking about um you know i've looked at 10 demands it all sounds great but don't use the word defund. Don't use the word abolish. Um, that's absurd. I mean, how could you, what do you mean no cops? Like, like um, what about the rapists and murderers? Um, and so one of the things I always say is, you know, one, you mentioned it. This is not about lack of response, lack of accountability. It's true accountability. Another, you also mentioned, it doesn't happen overnight. This is like a gradual 
process. It's a never ending process toward liberation. Um, what do you say when you get that? Because I'm sure you hear it the same. Yeah. So the, the first the first thing I say is you, you don't make policy in anything except for criminal law. You don't make you make you don't make policy based upon the outlier cases, right? And unfortunately, be, we do in the criminal context. We make policy based upon the, the, the like the. And it's not even just what do you do about people who who are charged with rape or, or or murder. It's it's like the serial rapist and murderer who you know has no mental health issues and is incorrigible, and you know for sure because you can see into the future will do it again and again. <laughs> so it's again, I mean, very right off the bat, it's like doesn't <laughs> a person doesn't exist. Yeah, Rarely, if ever, do, do they exist? They don't exist. Um, and, and you don't make what's the percentage. Reasons. What's the percentage of serial killers? Right? Like it's like less than one. I, I have no idea. I've ne I've ne I've never met one. I mean, here's the other thing. It's like the truth <laughs> sociopath. I've never met a truth sociopath. I represented thousands yeah. and yeah. thousands of people. I've represented people who really like you know, aside from the fact that you know that. The, um, yeah, I, I represented people that were like the, the, what people would term the worst of the worst. And, and even there, even even these cases, I was always, always, I was going to say surprised, but I, but after a while, I wasn't surprised when I would literally within a minute of getting, you know, seeing the criminal court complaint, what they were charged with and like cases that were like the cover you know, of New York Post the worst cases you can possibly imagine in terms of charge, walking back and meeting someone that was completely, it was, it was so much more complicated. You know, um, uh, someone who, I mean, I'm just, I'm thinking of, of one case in particular who would have been like the poster child for like the reason why we can't have abolition. And um, this is someone talking with his family and talking with his, um, uh, with, with him, uh, was so intellectually disabled, was so, um, was failed at every single stage of the process by government, was trying, you know, mom, I met mom who had tried for decades to get him the right individualized education plan, to get him assessed, to find a special education program that would work for him, to get him really early intervention from the time he was in his single digits. And just seeing these failures over and over again, because we wound up spending so much time and energy and money on, on, on policing that like, he just fell through the cracks. And um, anyway, I mean, it's just like, even in those most horrific cases, uh, those cases often, like in this case actually can be the argument for abolition. Um, uh, and even there, so, so what do you do? So someone that is so damaged, right? That's the word damage. What do you do then? You don't, throw them in a prison or a cage. That person needs help, <laughs> okay? And maybe for a period of time that, that help, as long as it's voluntary and consensual, um, which in my experience it has been, um, is it works with mental health professionals and, and, and uh, in collaboration with, with family and with, uh, with you know, folks from our staff. Anyway, it's just, it's what I say is, it's, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's non carceral. And again, it's, it's like when you pick those examples, those tend to be the, like the, the, the signal that, that, that the system has failed in other cases. I mean, the other poster children beyond like the worst cases are the things where you see like New York post write about arrested in five, in five years, 115 arrests. This person walks free. This is, you know, this is why we need more. And it's just like someone if, if the system worked, you'd expect that one of those 115 times they were arrested, prosecuted, caged, and then put back out. One of those times, you know, suddenly the, it, there would be a change and they, would, uh, they wouldn't they yeah. would feel the need to, um, you know, steal a Red Bull from a bodega for resale value again. Um, right. It's those cases, too, that just actually wind up being the example of the need for a total uh, for total change, but, but actually, but I want to address like the words defund and, and, and abolish. You know, it's, it's what this I'll say important. is, I, hold on, this is important yeah, yeah. coming from you because you're not just an abolitionist. You're not just a public defender. Your focus is telling, and I think this is unique and, and, and really powerful, telling individual stories that change the collective narrative using media 
using, you know, presentation tools, using words, using images. So this is, you know, um, like if anyone is like the, the most appropriate person to address what language we're using, I, I think I think it's you. So now, <laughs> please go on. Well, let me let me actually let me say first and really major disclaimer that like my you know my ideas now the things that I think think about um, you know in abolition like I am I'm a late in the game B I am white and privileged C um, so so there's C D and then goes all the way to Z a million disclaimers um, I learned though from from abolitionists who have been uh, thinking and writing about this for decades. Um, that it is the place for the for people that are in the uh, class of the oppressor. If we have a platform to step up and speak out, so I actually I'll just say like I've had discomfort. Um, you know, initially it was of confidence, like I'm doing my thing, and then a lot of pushback to the fact that a white privileged male um, lawyer to boot <laughs> was was speaking out about this stuff, and I really had to check myself and check in with folks that knew way more than me, but. That, that, that's, that, that struck to me. I mean, look who you're talking to. I, I mean, this is exactly what my experience has been too. Really important that, you know, while due to my background, I've, I was kind of volunteered by the team to be this public face of 10 demands. I'm also, you know, a white Jewish guy and, um, and privileged. And, you know, my worst problems are the crying cats in the background. And, you know, um, the re, you know, like there's a black woman, a black man, um, an indigenous woman, an immigrant woman. Um, that's the rest of 10 demands. So I can learn a ton from them and have, and obviously so much more so from the, you know, Dereka uh, Purnell's of the world and uh, Mariam Kaba's. And um, so I can certainly relate uh, to what you're saying, um, but I do. And, and I think that, you know, that that says a lot, like you don't, have to use your platform for good you are you are using your privilege for good so you know you people who make that choice should be commended we move on after we don't harp on it but like that's a good choice and you know i i, I think um you know your your many years of experience meeting with people who go through the system provides you the credibility to to more than speak on this I appreciate that. And I, 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 well, I'll say I learned kind of, I do a lot of listening and I learned uh, the hard way um, about the importance of using language that's uncomfortable um, as part of a broader strategy. I, I, I tweeted something about, about like some focus group. This is like months ago or way, way long. It was like a year, maybe a year and a half ago, focus group that found like that, the, that when you frame something in terms of defund, people were less likely to support it. But if you change the language to redistribute funds, wh whatever it was, uh, it was more pal palatable to right. uh, the kind of the white moderate class or whatever. And I was like messaging, you know, words matter. And right. I got reached out to by folks who, I got a lot of negative, I got, I got, I got support from people who are like, you know, mod, you know, moderates and white liberals and, you know, folks, but then a lot of pushback, um, some very rightfully so, like very angry online about like, how dare I, and then got some way nicer call in approaches from folks that I really, really respect and, and realized, you know, through there and, and, and thought about it, that again, these words like defund, like abolition, um, they are going to turn a lot of people off, maybe at, at first, but there is power in powerful language. There's powerful, there's power in not sugarcoating shit. There's power, like, like, you know, like the opposite word, like reform uh, it is a really good example of, of why, of kind of the problem with sugarcoating, you know, reform is comfort is comforting. It's changing. It's 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 incremental. It's not um, you know a full. full but it, what it happens is it allows people to be kind of um, lulled into a uh, kind of a never-ending just tinkering, right? And that and be okay with that. Jarring language like cages instead of someone being held in prison. Um, you know, uh, cops instead of law enforcement implying then laws are enforced equally. Um, racist instead of like 
you know, disproportionate impact, whatever you want to say. These are important because they wake people up and they um, change the discourse, uh, even if early on uh, uh, focus groups are not going to are not going to feel it. It's important, though, to note at the same time, language like that, like any kind of strategy, is part of a broader language. It's part of a broader strategy. And so in the work that we do uh, at Zealous, which is uh, a lot of, of supporting local coalitions of, of and strengthening, and create, helping to, to facilitate coalitions between defenders, people with direct experience, organizers, and artists in, lo in, in localities across the country, a lot of what we're trying to figure out is who is the messenger um, for any, you know, if you could come up with a, a strategy, but then who's the messenger, who says what that can be most effective, who are you, who's the audience? What kind of, you know, what kind of language do you use behind and in front of the scenes? Um, and so, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's all product, part of a broader solution, but the, the um, kind of short answer is, uh, you know, I, I think, I mean, first of all, I, you know, I defer to people who know more than me and that deference points to um, the fact that it's important to lean in um, and not sugarcoat language um, because people need to be jarred. All right, good answer. Um, and I've always <laughs> taken the the stance that, um, you know, you, whoever you are, whether you're a politician running for something or just a, a Twitter person can use whatever language you want. <clears throat> I'm an abolitionist. I'm going to use the correct language, the language that scares you. And if I'm terrifying, you know, maybe you'll listen to someone a little less terrifying who's proposing um, defunding in a more, in a, in a way that scares you a little less. I mean, you know, and, and so we at 10 Demands, um, you know, develop this like road to abolition. It includes a lot of um, reforms that we don't believe fall under the, you know, the concept of reformism in that they are steps toward abolition. Each each part of each demand chips away at the system to the point where we can be at a place where we can abolish in its entirety. Um, and so we kind of, in our intention or our, you know, our mission is to kind of serve as a guide to um, organizers on the ground um, who might be trying to push um, a city council um, or a mayor um, because we, you know, we believe that again, like each time, something new is introduced that's an alternative to our status quo um, that is a whole community that is improved. And on top of that, it's adding to that library of data where we can use to convince the next city council. Um, but it also speaks to the importance of being local, local politics. So um, to conclude, I know you only have about eight minutes left. Tell me more about um, your organization and, you know, give me some examples of some of the, the things you've done. I think you worked on Still in Prison, um, which is super cool. So you tell people about that maybe, but why focus um, on ways of, you know, instead of thinking this massive national scale, um, why are you going into finding local um, projects and supporting those? Okay. Um, number one, people think that everything comes from Congress, but um, when it comes to a lot of things, but including criminal justice, uh, uh, crim I say criminal justice, I always have to use air quotes. Um, it, it's a hyper, it's a, always very hyper local. Um, and, 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 and it's the, kind of this concept of, it's called federalism, this idea of, of laboratories of democracy. Like, under the Constitution, it gives states the ability to try out different things when it comes to criminal justice. So that's where the true action's happening. The federal criminal jurisdiction is way too big, um, but but relative to the number, you know, number of people caged, it's about um, a quarter of, of, the, of the, the, the reach of the criminal legal system is federal. Everything else is local. So that's number one uh, and why we, why we do this. We actually don't invite ourselves in. We get invited in um, by by local coalitions and kind of a range of ways. Often what happens is, and I'll, I'll talk, talk about a couple of examples, but they'll see something that, they'll see like an output. They'll see a, um, a project like Still in Prison where, where it's, you know, just gripping film and a website and, and identity and brand and, and kind of translating a very complex legal issue called non-unanimous juries into something that is very digestible. The fact that 
There is a law that was passed by the KKK in 1934 in the progressive state of Oregon that is still keeping people in cages. What is the law? It allowed two jurors, usually minorities, voices to be silenced so that even if they found that the predominantly Black defendant was not guilty, that, that, that the prosecution didn't prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt, their voices could be silenced. And there was only one other state in the entire other country, and that was, uh, that was Louisiana that allowed it similarly passed by the KKK. And there's one person who can actually do something about it, the progressive, heavy air quotes, Attorney General of Oregon. And she is not only not choosing to do anything, she fought in the Supreme Court and the Louisiana side to keep non ministers. Anyway, so they, could, they see something like that, and they're like, hey, can you do that for us? And my answer, or one of my colleagues' answers, we're a team of seven now, growing about 10 all over the place. Um, and uh, what I'll say is, you know, we could, you know, like, you know, we, we could try and do something like it, but number one, we're not a comp shop. Uh, number two, us coming in, because us coming in just like doing a thing, would make you rely on us to, you know, for the next thing. You'd lose the opportunity actually as if you're a defender organization or you're, you're a local organizer, or you're an artist or you're someone with direct experience to actually learn from, you know, learn these, these kind of non-traditional legal advocacy skills. You don't learn a law school, you learn an organizer school, you know. Uh, um, uh, and, and you also lose the opportunity to actually like tr build, use this, moment and this pressing issue in this campaign to build local coalition. Um, and so I think a, a perfect example I'll leave you with uh, of, of how we work is Prince George's County, Maryland. Uh, may, uh, biggest county in Maryland, second biggest, I don't know, but right outside of DC, I should know this, right outside of DC. Um, COVID has just started and there are people in like everywhere, horrible conditions inside their local jail being held pretrial. Um, it's not even worth going into the horrible uh, conditions, but we're, we're talking you know, denials of medical care um, uh, and, and the worst conditions you can possibly imagine, people being placed with symptomatic people, COVID raging. Um, public defenders were on the ground using traditional legal methods in court fighting valiantly and judges were already rubber stamping and just saying kind of like denied. Um, uh, there was a the local organization, the court watch program, there's one court watcher, a volunteer, formerly incarcerated woman who was sitting in court every day writing amazing, powerful um, uh, accountability letters to the prosecutor, wasn't getting any answers. And the extraordinary folks at Civil Rights Corps, run by Alec Eric and Sanis, who I think you've already interviewed, had come in and sued the county and marshaled 60 sworn declarations from people inside of those cages um, to, and, 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 and sent it over and submitted them to this progressive, when I mean, you keep using that word, heavy air quotes, um, uh, federal judge who dismissed them as only marginally relevant, unhelpful, and she complained she couldn't call the chaff from the wheat. So they call us and they've seen something else and they say, hey, can you do a thing? And we're like, I gave the answer. And what we wound up doing was with them, working together with, with public defenders and the local community. And we, we brought in artists to think through this concept and collectively come up with a strategy to have a range of folks um, from singers and songwriters like Fiona Apple to famous actors like Alec Baldwin to a range of black law school deans and advocates. And we partnered with Broadway Advocacy Coalition read these letters. Um, so, and, and, and we published, it was called Gasping for Justice. It was gaspingforjustice.org. And what we saw was we went from an audience of one judge to millions of people. We weren't limited by, or they weren't limited by kind of the facts of the case. No one of the, we didn't, there was no mention of what the people were charged with because it doesn't matter. No one should be facing that kind of horror. Um, and, and we used a different type of media than is traditional inside a court, which is writing, even though civil rights court is the most extraordinary writing and public defenders did amazing oral advocacy, didn't work. Um, and what we saw was amazing outcomes. We saw, uh, we saw uh, that one court watcher, the call to action was volunteer over 200 court watchers. And it's become the, 
the largest national volunteer virtual court watch program in the entire country. And they're now about to start launching a campaign to expand virtual court watch across the country. $25,000 raised for the bail fund to bail people out. Um, the uh, state's attorney was forced to come on and answer for her uh, her choices um, in a way that wasn't ever done before. Students at Howard Law got involved and wrote this amazing report after court watching. And most recently, three weeks ago, it took some time, but the county came to the negotiating table and actually settled um, with the people from inside of jail who had sued them uh, to an accepted court, uh, accepted monitoring for, for months, uh, major changes on the inside. And that's so, so that, that and, and, but I, what I would say is most importantly, the coalition between defenders and people with direct experience, folks on the inside and artists, there's now a coalition where they had kind of worked together, but they were mostly operating in silos that now is focused full bore on you know, continuing the campaign that they're doing for decarceration, but now expanding to court watch. And so the real, the real power of what we're trying to do is yes, like meet as much impact as we can have right off the bat, but really helping to support longer term capacity building and strengthening coalition for the long-term fight for what we're talking about today, which is ultimately abolition. Well, that's an incredible story. Um, that's awesome. Um, so my offer still stands. I'm an artist and a marketing person. You uh, are welcome to have me at any time. Um, before I let you go, I'm going to keep you one more second. You mentioned court watching. It's something that um, I believe Alec mentioned to me when I asked him this question. Um, for someone who's not currently engaged in a local effort or a national one, what is your recommendation as far as supporting those who are most impacted um, and fighting for an alternative to cops and cages. Softball, crack it, court watch. Um, no, seriously. So what is, just really quickly, what is court watch? It's not just packing the court, which is powerful, you know, coming into court and being like, we're here standing against injustice. The problem with that approach or the limitations is that the courts purposely have this really arcane legal language. Even I, as a trained lawyer, public defense, if I went to another state, I wouldn't understand what's going on. What, they, what it is, is it's a group of volunteers and you're trained on the language of court and trained to look for specific things and keep track of specific things that the prosecutors are doing and the judges are doing to hold them accountable. There is a right, a public right to an open court. Um, and a big reason for that, maybe the leading reason is accountability for the people who are, are kind of running the system. And so you can court watch right now. If you, what you should do is you should Google and just like say court watch whatever city you're in. But even if your city doesn't have a court watch, there's increasing numbers of virtual court watches popping up across the country. So uh, Prince George's County is one of them. Most of the people who are court watching um, are all over all are all over the country, um, and um, and so the reason why it's important is what we what we're already seeing is when there are court watchers, when people are watching and and giving feedback. Not only are we, are we uh, developing data and statistics to use for the longer term fight, um, but actors uh, act differently when they're being watched and when they're being watched in an intelligent way, um, and so. It's, uh, you don't have to volunteer and go five days a week. Um, it works around, you work around your schedule, but that, I think it's literally the most um, kind of meaningful thing you can do right now um, if you want to fight. Uh, I'm going to say fight against the system. You can say fight against the system. If you want accountability, if you want fairness, if you want the people who are supposed to be acting like your elected DAs in your interests, hold them accountable. The way to do it is just court watch. Great. Thank you so much. Um, can you commit to reviewing the 10 demands and um, endorsing if you agree and telling me why behind the scenes if you don't? Yes. Right. Uh, and I, by the way, I, I, I did I did review them and I like and I, and I will review them again. Um, uh, but I I, uh, I did not see anything that was inconsistent with um, with things that I believe in and going back you know, increment, an incre incremental change also is not, as long as the incremental change isn't in the kind of the defund conversation, just moving little things around and taking little clips off, but actually meaningful on a, with an intention, the lodestar being abolition, that's consistent with abolition. 
Right. And that's right. consistent with, I would say, my, what, how I view. It's a right. personal thing, how I view abolition. As right. long as we're being, we're being very careful about who you work with um, and, and the ultimate goal, you know, incrementalism is not, is not necessarily a dirty word. Right. Like it can be incremental to end cash bail. That's a great choice toward abolition, right? Like, um, all right. Yeah. And, and honestly, it's just as important to us to get constructive feedback. You know, we've edited these a bunch of times. Um, we're only so many people. And like you've said, you know, these are our, our these are, these are our opinions. Um, and so there's a lot we can learn from, from each other. And I learned a ton from you today and I, I really appreciate your time and all the work that you do. Right back at you. Thanks for having me. All right. Talk to you soon. Peace. Peace.